Welcome to another edition of A Voice to the Gentile Church. I'm Jim Wingerter. Next to me is Pastor Roger Diaz. Next to him is Dolores Lowe and Dolores Nancy hits the news again. Oh, Lord. She's had a pardon from the papacy. Yes. The I just wanted to say the alliteration of pardon <laughs> from the papacy. Yeah, so the wicked witch that we know of. Yes, holy Pelosi. cow. <laughs> Um, I mean, most Democrats that I know don't respect her. <laughs> nope. Like Harry Reid, she just took his place when he when he retired. Yeah. She's a powerful lady, though, and it makes me wonder how did she attain to all this power? <sighs> mm. Yep. A little witchcraft here and there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so you, I don't know if you if, if everyone remembers a few months ago the Archbishop of San Francisco, who is her priest. Um, forbade her from receiving communion because yeah. of her support for we, we talked about that uh, a while back, yeah. Right. So she went to the Vatican this month and um, went to the Pope and promptly received communion, right? Now, I happen to have been a Catholic, right? So sure. I grew up in Catholic. I had all my catechism, you know, did all my first communion, the whole bit. And I know that in order to receive communion, you have to a go to confession first, mm -hmm. and b you have to be you have to support the standing of the church, right? Because to not support the standing of the church is viewed as sin, right? She obviously does not support the standing of the church because the official standing of the Catholic Church is anti-abortion, right? Pro-life, correct. We'll give them some credit there. Yeah. <clears throat> well, although Francis hasn't exactly been no, the most. He's not the poster child for, right. yeah. Right. I mean, his predecessor was very much pro-life. Right. Very stringent pro-life as a pope. And Francis is like the antithesis of that. So. so anyway, either A, Nancy Pelosi doesn't really care what her priest says, and neither does Francis. Right. I mean, you know, look at the position it puts him in. Right. So, according, to Francis just basically wants to, he, he's doing the, if, if he weren't Catholic, I would say he was hyper-grace. Well, you know, the hyper-grace movement is a part of the change in the fundamental, the fundamental Christian movement. Uh, this change began with the emergent church movement, and Pope Francis has been a part of that. Uh, if I wasn't so cons conspiratorial, I would say he was at the head of it. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I am. So yeah. I think, I think there's a possibility that the whole movement that became the emergent church movement did have something to do with the Vatican and the Jesuits, right? So right. behind much of the the the, uh, the conspiracies that we see in, in Christianity concerning the Vatican has to do with the Jesuits. The Pope is a Jesuit. So I won't be surprised at all if there's a connection there with hyper grace. But you know, this whole thing with Nancy going to the Vatican because she was re refused communion out in San Francisco, it just paints the broader picture of the mess that we're in, where a, a, a sitting Pope can just engage in such such wrongness, I, mm -hmm. you know, there are many words right. I can use, but this is wrong. Uh, Nancy Pelosi for decades have been pro-life, not just pro-life, but pro-abortion. Right. And vehemently uh, pro-abortion, she's committed to it. And why would a sitting pope uh, support her, you know, arbitrate for her, or to, or to allow her to, to get away with what she's doing? Because it's all corrupt. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they're trying to aggravate the American people. Clearly, they're trying to get a response from the American people, who I think used to be generally conservative, but are no longer. Right. So I'm not surprised by Nancy Pelosi at all, and none of none of this surprises I'd me. I'd be interested in knowing why she went to the Vatican. Did she go expressly for that purpose, or did she go because she's working on some other well, project? Well, it's easy to have six months or a year ago even uh, found out that the, the the local diocese in San Francisco is going to refuse her communion. Right. Maybe a year ago that happened. Six months ago it became public. So they probably had this trip planned so for a year. 
And to, just to show them that, you know, the Pope is ours, or we are his. So did my and tax dollars pay for her to go to the Vatican? Your tax dollars there you go. <laughs> pay for her to go so that she could give $25,000 from the State Department to a chair, the Catholic But that's charities. crumbs. To right. use, to use so it was free. just an excuse, right? Yes, absolutely. Right. They use. We're going to give a. We're going to give a grant to Catholic charities, and that grant was a whopping twenty-five thousand. The lady's close to being a billionaire. Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's it's such a sham and, and such a shame, what's happening in this country. Anyway. So yeah. anything yeah. better than Pelosi will be good at this point. Okay. So um, maybe. I'm going to jump around a little bit before I get to what I consider to be happy news. Happy, so let's happy. Go. Um, so on another note, so if you remember about six months ago, Ben and Jerry's, lovely Ben and Jerry's that they are, joined the BDS movement and did not want Ben and Jerry's ice cream sold in the West Bank, right? And, and what we call the biblical, biblical Israel. Israel. Today is Samaria, yeah. Right. Now... The way it is structured, Ben & Jerry's was sold to Unilever, which is a, a large corporation. Think of like Johnson & Johnson. Stuff oh. like. And, but they retained certain rights when they sold to Unilever. Don't ask me why Unilever allowed that. They should have just, they bought them outright. That should have been it. So the way that it has been traditionally done is Ben & Jerry's in Israel is owned by a company that's called American Products incorporate it's an israeli company however mm. the ice cream even though it's ben and jerry's ice cream is made in a plant in israel and the problem is the majority of sales of that ice cream happen where in biblical judea and samaria okay so to ban that ice cream from being sold in biblical judea and samaria makes it like not even worth it Unilever, in their attempt to get out of the whole mess, right? Because it, it was a mess. It became right. a mess, right? It became people on both sides arguing at each other and all that. Decided to just sell Ben & Jerry's in Israel to that company. So there would be a separate corporation sold to that Israeli company who would continue to run in Ben & Jerry's. You know, the Israeli people would have never seen the difference because it's already made in Israel. So Ben & Jerry's themselves, Ben Cohen and Jerry, I can't remember, Greenfield or whatever, have now sued Unilever to try to stop that sale. Now Unilever is saying, sales done, we're not, we're not, we're done, we're not discussing this. So I guess it'll be interesting when it gets to court what's going to happen. Hmm. So they made it a sticky wicket and they're making it more of a... Yep, more of a sticky More of wicket. a problem. Mm -hmm. So supposedly the sale went through and on the 29th of June. And now Ben & Jerry's is suing, claiming that this will undermine the integrity of the Ben & Jerry's brand. I hope they get a judge that laughs. <laughs> yes, I hope so too. <laughs> oh, the saga it's called, continues. The company's called Quality, American Quality Products Limited. And they sell all sorts of American products in Israel. That's what they do. No. We make anything they want. <laughs> <laughs> so the BDS movement is still in momentum. It's still mm -hmm. effective. It's still, yep. It is still affecting Israel right. at this point. Although the interesting thing is it is against the law in the U.S. to boycott another country. Oh, but you're talking about Israel. Yeah, I know. So, so I, I, you know, certainly the judge has a, a standing to rule, right? Does it genuinely yeah. affect them? affect the Israelis? Israel. No. No. Like, I don't buy Ben and Jerry's it's, ice cream. I'm talking about BDS in general. The word right. BDS in general is still yep. affecting Israel. Right. Yeah. Well, it's it's the strategy of the left, right? Always Everything. Been sanctioned. Sanctioned. Sanctions, cancellation. We'll cut off their sources. Yeah, yeah, all the wokeness. That's their strategy, right? Yeah. It's been it's been that way. Uh, the, the strategy of the left actually goes back to what is clearly demonic and, and of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he's been, he's been using that ploy for a long time. Yep. So um, on other news, it is the 10-year anniversary of the Higgs boson Tell us particle. what the Higgs boson is. It is a particle that, okay, so 
It's a subatomic particle, which means that it helps to oh, make... Oh, by the way, friends, Dolores is a... Phys <laughs> is a <new> <laughs> no, I am not she, a physicist. She's I'm a, a physicist. Um, it's a, <laughs> a subatomic particle, which when they all come together and start binding, that's what electrons, protons, you know, all of those are made of, right? The uniqueness of the Higgs boson is that it has a zero rotation, right? Most particles have one degree or half a degree of rotation, boson has none, right? Which makes some interesting things, like it can be in two places at once kind of thing. Oh, the string theory. Yeah, string all, theory that, all that craziness. Yeah. So, Interdimensionalism. Right, exactly. Uh. So CERN fired up their collider this past Tuesday? What day? Uh, sorry. Yeah, yesterday. yesterday. Sorry, the yesterday. Fifth, fifth of, <laughs> all fifth the days July, flow yeah. together. And um, they were not dealing with the Higgs boson, but they did find um, there is some, some disagreement about this, whether or not these are real exotic particles. That they, they found a tetraquark, or One no, a pentaquark. So oh. quarks are subatomic particles, and they also help to make protons, neutrons, you know. And they are part of the four laws, right? The four strengths, the, the, the weak strength, the strong strength, the electromagnetic, and gravity, right? So those are the, the four things that basically make up everything in the universe, right? So they claim they found a pentaquark. Penta, of Five. course, we know what that means. Right. But what's and up going to now, we've always had tetraquarks. Tetra meaning mean three. Yeah. Right? Three. So we'll see. There are people arguing that CERN made the announcement, oh, we found another exotic particle. But there are physicists arguing that it wasn't an exotic particle, that it's just the same old thing. So what is their goal? I mean, they've put, no doubt, trillions of dollars into this. They have 5,000 at least of the world's greatest nuclear physicists mm -hmm. out there. What are they looking for, Dolores? I, we've been we've been talking about and hearing about the worship of Shiva, the Hindu goddess of war out there. We've been hearing and seeing videos, hearing about and seeing videos of occultic practices going mm -hmm. on over there. What are they looking for? They are looking for so. There's a thing called the unifying theory. Okay. Which is the theory of everything, right? How Let me everything, get my phone out look it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the theory of how the universe oh, works the and how it all... Oh, the theory of everything. Comes, I, right. I, I, okay. right? So, um, it should a, be a movie title. Yeah, A big proponent of the unifying theory was Hawkins, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, the, the theory of everything I know a little bit about. Yeah. So they are trying to find validation of that, right? And validation of how the universe works. That's what they're doing. I think in the end, they're looking to find a genie in the bottle. They're trying to control God. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. But Hawkins was against. Hawkins was. He was against. Did better. Mm -hmm. he, he was against the, the, the experiments. He so, told yeah. them they were crazy with what they were doing. Yeah. They were taking risks they shouldn't right. be taking. Of course, there's a lot of, uh, on the fringe side of this, a lot mm -hmm. of concern that they're going to create a black hole. Mm -hmm. They'll swallow up the earth. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, other people are saying this has to do with what we see in Revelation chapter 9. They are opening up of the, the pit of Abaddon or well, Abaddon. That's, that's I don't think so. I think, uh, I think they're not going to be that successful. <laughs> um, I think they're going to keep meddling with this. The effect of this is peering into a realm that we're not allowed to peer into because that's all they're doing. They're trying to perceive, quantify things. Mm -hmm. I don't think Revelation chapter 9 is going to be fulfilled at CERN. I think they're going to keep dabbling with this and the conclusion is going to be ultimately that the spirit realm is real. This unseen realm, you know, string theory, the fourth dimension, it's real and the ancients knew about this is ultimately the conclusion that they're going to come to and they're going to, they're going to ultimately turn to occultism. Right. That we can achieve some of this by meddling in the occult. The Nazis did the same thing. Yep. Yeah. You know, the Thule Society, mm -hmm. uh, they interfered with the spirit realms using seances and human sacrifices. Yeah, the sad thing is, is eventually science catches up with the Bible, right? It's not the with other way around. Yeah, yeah, scientists like to say, oh, we're the 
you know, far ahead ones. And I'm like, no, you're no. catching up. The Bible right. says it, and you eventually catch up. Right. right. You know, there was a movement <laughs> in the 1800s called the Theophist Movement. Madam Helena Blavatsky was the founder of the Theophist uh, Movement order. And from the Theophist order came the Thule Society. And the Thule Society recognized Hitler as the Fuhrer, mm. the Messiah figure. And they're the ones who empowered the Nazis, the Thule, and they were Theophists. Theophism is the, the merging of science and occultism. Mm -hmm. You merge them together because they belong together. That's how they, Madame Helena Blavatsky uh, uh, fr uh, framed it. They belong together. But we're just talking about witchcraft. Yep. Uh, you know, just plain old yep. uh, common variety witchcraft. Even so this is what they're doing or attempting to do at CERN. They're just using a lot of uh, highly, uh, highly intelligent men with lots of toys to play with to try and get there. And a lot of money yeah. thrown at it. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, the sad thing is even when the evidence is in their face, they refuse to accept it, right? Yeah. Like most people will tell you, oh, the Big Bang, the Big Bang, right? But most physicists, they don't say this to everybody, what was the first thing that happened when the Big Bang happened, according yeah. to physics? Light. Light in the form of radiation. Right. Oh, yeah. Bright light. Right. Right? And what does the Bible say? What is the opening? Well, Let there be light. And there I'm was like, light. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but they still refused to accept it. So I understand that when they arrived at, their, at their, the conclusion of their great experiment, and soon, at that very time, the Georgia Guidestones disappeared. Yep. <laughs> you that? were stealing my good news. <laughs> <laughs> or was the word that they blew up? Where they, they blew up. They were exploded. They they so had they brought is, in. What is the municipality in Georgia it saying is. about this? By the way, folks, we have to talk about what the uh, Georgia Guidestones are. Um, All right. So you yes. want, you want to explain? Let's what clarify the, that. Yeah. You want to explain what the Georgia Guidestones are? So the are? Georgia Guidestones were a bunch of stones. Think of stone. I think three of them. Yeah. Are monolithic structures. Right. Yeah. The 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 offensive thing about the Georgia Guidestone is that they put the 10 different, they put on 10 principles. The 10 for, Commandments of the New World Order. Oh, right, it's yeah. basically what it is. You know, the 10 Commandments as seen by the Club of Rome, you know, one of our favorite new, people, yeah, right? New World Order for. Yeah, and you know, the first one is maintain humanity under 500,000. I mean, 500, 500 million, million. Sorry. sorry, I keep saying, because that's how it keeps in balance with nature. The second Sustainable one. Sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. Use, use their terminology, right? So mm -hmm. right. sustainable growth. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. So, Abortion. Mm -hmm. Margaret Cali, Sanger worship had, of Cali. Yeah, Margaret Sanger had nothing on these people. Ah. <laughs> Unite humanity with a new living language. Ooh. Live, what's a living language? I have no idea what a living language is. because Perhaps something to do with the occult? Possibly, Maybe. but our language changes all the time. We're adding new words all the time, so I'm sorry, it's living. Anyway, um, rule, passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. So now you can't have your faith. You can only have the faith that is approved by them. With tempered reason, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. Protect people and nations with laws and just courts. Sounds good until they put it into Well, mm -hmm. who knows what those courts are going to be advocating. Um, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. I wonder if J Joe Biden mm, has heard that. Wow. <laughs> now that, that right there, <laughs> on the surface sounds, hmm, but between yes. the lines, it's incredibly dangerous. Now, <laughs> if they said term limits for everybody... Everybody would go for it. <laughs> yes. Balance personal rights with social duties. Ah. The woke. That's the wokeism. Woke. That's, that's wokeism. what we're seeing now with all of the gender neutrality yeah. things. Yeah. Prize truth, beauty, love, and seeking harmony with the infinite. Ah. Now there's your occultic base right there. Yeah. And then finally, be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. They have to put that one in twice. Ah. <laughs> so, so that goes back to the first commandment. <laughs> the first commandment, right. which was sustainable, sustainable growth. growth. All right. So this is this. So is, these things were blown up. Is that right? Yep. So wow. And the interesting thing is, there are 
it's there are cameras around it, right? Like mm -hmm. most most places in the world now, you can't go anywhere without being filmed, yeah. right? You're kind of stupid if you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if it was in New York, it would still be there. <laughs> True. I mean, <laughs> well, why did we pick Georgia to be the place where we put this? Those thing? stones <laughs> have aggravated a lot of people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And information because of people like myself have been going out for decades about how horrible that thing is. Mm -hmm. So maybe someone decided mm -hmm. finally that it's got to go or again, maybe it's soon. I don't know. So you, there are two theories. Okay. <laughs> one, one is that somebody blew it up. Yeah. <laughs> and the other theory is that there was a small earthquake. Oh, come on. That would, that would be with the CERN thing, now, right? Now, it's interesting. We were up in South Carolina last week, and there were, there were earthquakes. We felt them. The, uh, the one, one was a 3.2. We weren't near the epicenter, no. but we were like 50 miles away, and we felt it in the house. It shook the house. It wasn't bad enough that, that furniture moved around or that plates came out of the cabinet or anything like that. No, the, the thing about the stones, when I first started looking, those stones appeared there in 1984. Uh, What's the significance of 84, right? Yep. They just kind of pop, there they are. So huh. I, I looked into this for a long, long time. Those things were well placed. Mm -hmm. They were there to last forever. An earthquake, They're huge. An earthquake wouldn't have right. brought them down. Might have knocked one over, no. but it wouldn't have. No, wouldn't have yep. brought them down. Uh, you know, is it possible? I mean, considering that those Ten Commandments of the New World Order, you, we just, you just read them. Mm -hmm. They're all blasphemous. Yes. And there's hidden language in there that's pointing to the occult and right. the worship of the right. devil, actually. Is it possible that God made a statement? Yep. On the very day that humanity is on the other side of the world, popping uh, neutrons and whatever else, um, he decided to shake things up a little bit for them. Is that possible? Yep. I think it certainly is, right? So, so at noon today... You took the burden <laughs> off of some redneck anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Redneck. Well, hey. at noon Some of my best friends are redneck. <laughs> so at noon today, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation put out a statement asking, they claim that unknown individuals detonated an explosive device at the site, because this happened like 4 a.m. Tuesday night, right? And they are asking for help if anyone has any information or anything like that, which is what makes it curious because they should have video. We well, know we're going to prosecute. Who's going to tell them? Yeah. <laughs> so no, some 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 person decided that I'll we'll take down these stones of abomination. Yep. <sighs> they'll build other. They'll build. They'll build some more. You know, the stones have been there for decades, right? And we 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 see that in <laughs> since '84, since they appeared on that spot. This global movement has succeeded in laying its own real foundation. So they don't need those stones anymore. The stones have made its th their statement. Where where were they located in Georgia? Elbert County, wherever yeah. that is. Out in the boondocks. Yeah, and it's nobody really. There's some mystery about how they came up. Nobody really knows who put them up. One Mr. Like Mr. Lovelace, I think his name was Lovelace or mm -hmm. something, was associated with them. Um, but I, I read this a long time ago. They, they, ha they, ha they had succeeded in connecting it to globalists. Okay. Like Club of Rome type. Yeah. I could just see George globalists. Soros out there saying, back it up, back mm -hmm. it up. <laughs> Well, they're going to repair them, uh, whoever. Or, re or replace them with or something bigger. Them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe the, the stones will appear in Washington, D.C. It's a rural site seven miles north of Elberton on Georgia Highway 77. And the 77. land that it's on is, is county land. North of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I remember. There's not uh, much more north of Atlanta in Georgia. Yeah. About Ten years ago, it was around the time that I first became pastor here at Fellowship Church. Um, I spoke about this one night, and there was a lady in the class who didn't want to accept it, couldn't believe it. Mm. So she looked it up on the Internet. There was a lot less information on the Internet then about it. And she jumped in her vehicle and went up there and saw them. Yep. She stood there and looked at them. She had to see them for herself. And she came back and she told me they're real. Yeah, this article they're says... There. This article says the, the Christian community have labeled the monument the Devil's Monument or a monument to Satan and his minions obsessed with eugenics. 
Yeah. So. More or less. They were right there with Margaret Sanger. Yeah. Well, she was probably one of the one of the influences behind something like that. Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh, that's, that's that's good news. I that's guess. What the, that, news. Well, that was my happy news. Sorry, happy, happy, I mean, happy. Sorry if if somebody doesn't that, like it. Well, we think <laughs> we think that's happy news. Yeah. That's happy news. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question. Yes. And the question is, I'm going to read the whole thing. It's not too long. You mentioned in one of your classes that Christopher Columbus was not an Italian but was the illegitimate son of, Portuguese, of a Portuguese prince and a Jewish mother. I looked this up and there seems to be some history that supports this claim. Although, in honesty, because I've looked at it too, there's, there's more of the traditional story of Columbus online. Than, I mean, mm-hmm. you have to look for this yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But you also said that Columbus was a vessel of God for the establishment of his kingdom. This is very controversial and it leaves me wondering how can this be? Please explain. Yeah, so uh, I would need six hours, <laughs> a PowerPoint, and a chalkboard to really uh, to really ex- expound on this at any at any level. Uh, I do have some some history on this. I do have some information on this, and it's rich. It's incredibly uh, rich and well grounded. In the last. 15 or 20 years, in fact, this goes back to the early 1990s, since the Vatican made the statement that their involvement in the Portuguese Inquisition, Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition, and expulsion of the Jews was wrong. They made that statement back in 91. Since then, Portuguese and Spanish historians have been, has been liberated in a sense and, and been freed up to talk about actual history that involves the Jews of Spain and Portugal, which does involve and concern Columbus. So since then, gradually seeping out of uh, Spain and Portugal, mostly Portugal, is a different take on who Columbus actually was and his connection to the court of Portugal and to the Sephardic Jews of Spain and Portugal, Portugal mostly. So this history, this new overview on history has been coming out, coming out mostly from Europe, uh, Spain and Portugal. And I've been talking about this for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's becoming more and more verifiable and verified. There's a a documentary I want to plug at this point. Uh, The name of the documentary is, Is Christopher Columbus Who We Think He Is? Secrets, uh, Secrets and Lies of Columbus. It's made by an outfit called History Hit uh, on Timeline. They do documentaries on history. So again, is Christopher Columbus who we think he is? Secrets and Lies of Columbus. So I would, I would recommend that documentary. It's about an hour and a little over an hour long, and it's really informative and just packed with really good information. Any docu that isn't that long isn't covering the right. subject. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I, I, I reviewed it again this week, and uh, yeah, they, 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 they take all the points that I've been talking about for a long time, and they, they actually plugged in a lot of things that I didn't know that's become incredibly more insightful. So this is real history. The history we have, the, the, the conventional history we have on Columbus is, to say the least, incomplete and questionable. For instance, we know that, according to conventional history, he came from Genoa, Italy. He appeared in Genoa, which which is a port city in in Italy. He appeared there as a teenager. He changed his name, whatever his name was before. No one knows from the Italian perspective. And he changed his name at the cathedral in Genoa to Christopher Columbus. That's in English, but it. Cristobal Colón. Right. But <laughs> the documentation that's actually still available at that, at that cathedral indicates that his name was actually, in perfect Portuguese, accented with Portuguese, his name was Salvador Fernandes, Fernandes or Fernandes mm-hmm. Zaco. And that's how he signed his name, in perfect Portuguese, even with Portuguese accents, because 
the accents on Portuguese mm -hmm. words are yeah. different than then, with Spanish. Yep. So his name, actual name that he signed off and became Christopher Columbus with was Salvador Fernandes Zaco. Now, that's conventional history. By the way, Zaco and Fernandes are well-established Sephardic right. names. Zaco is a straightforward Sephardic Jewish name. Fernandes is a conversal name. Right. So the indications are that, yeah, he comes from a conversal family and he's in fact Jewish. So, but the, the truth about this also is that he never spoke Italian. He never, he's, he's written prolifically. In fact, in India, there are, there are whole libraries in India that focuses on his writings. And for whatever reason, India has the, 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 the museums over there and so on, they have a tremendous wealth of Columbus's writing. He was a prolific writer. He wrote a lot. And in every case he wrote in Portuguese, perfect Portuguese, never wrote in Italian. There's no record of him speaking Italian. He spoke Portuguese. So Columbus it, it was not... It reeks of he's not Italian. Right. <laughs> Columbus <laughs> is not Italian. And this is revolutionary. This upsets a lot of people. Conventional oh, sure. history, American conventional history, takes the position that this cannot be. He's Italian. He's a good Catholic Italian boy who appeared in, in Genoa. He had some strange name, and he became Christopher Columbus. Good Italian kid. Wasn't. Absolutely wasn't. So I'll, 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 tell, you a little, I'll tell you a little insight that, that I've been talking about for a long time, and the documentary that I recommended expands on this a lot. Mm -hmm. So according to what I've researched many, many years ago, he was actually born in a, a small town in Portugal called Cuba, or Cuba. And so I looked it up myself. I went to Cuba, Google Maps, and I, I did a lot of research on Cuba. And the Jewish history in Cuba, Portugal, is rich and well-grounded. Moranos, uh, the mm -hmm. conversos, were there for a long time. In fact, today, Cuba is one of those Portuguese towns, such as Belmonte, where Moranos, uh, crypto-Jews, uh, ben and Usim are beginning to come out of the closet. They're coming out of hiding. Mm -hmm. Cuba is one of those places yep. in Portugal. So Christopher <laughs> Columbus sailed from the Straits of Gibraltar. He left for the New World on Tisha B'Av huh. in 1492. The expulsion edict came out a few days before Tisha B'Av, and on Tisha B'Av, he sailed west to get to the east. Now, there's a lot of intrigue about that whole scenario that says that Columbus was actually a spy of the Portuguese court, King John of, of, of Portugal, that Columbus was actually functioning as a spy on behalf of the Portuguese court, the crown, uh, to lead Spain into a wild goose chase, which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. The Portuguese won the contest of getting to the Orient, we know that, yep. who won that, who, who, who achieved the spices <laughs> of the East? The Portuguese, why? Because while Columbus sailed west with the Spaniards, even though he was Portuguese, while he sailed west to get to the East, Vasco de Gama went south and east and attained mm -hmm. to the spices of the Orient. Right. Spain was in the Western Hemisphere doing what? Looking for gold mm -hmm. all of a sudden. Yep. Plans change. So conventional history has it completely wrong on, on Columbus. He was actually Portuguese. He grew up on the island of Madeira. According to the, the history that's being revealed now, he is the illegitimate son of a Jewish person who was forcibly, con a Jewish woman who was forcibly converted. A husband, well, not a husband, his, his father, his illegitimate father, was a prince of the court of, of King John of Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal. So his, his father was a prince. His mother was a Jewish person who was forcibly converted. And he is the illegitimate son of this union. Now, Cuba. Let's talk about Cuba. He grew up on the island of Madeira. It's on the island of Madeira, according to conventional history now, it's on the island of Madeira that he learned of the trade winds. Who did he learn of the trade winds from? The Portuguese fishermen, who for a thousand years, they believe, 
has been fishing off the west coast of this continent, excuse me, the east coast of this continent. So the, port, the Madeiran fishermen, who were all Sephardic Jews, who were coming to the east coast of this continent, you know, Nova Scotia mm -hmm. area, New England area, and catching codfish and taking it back to the Mediterranean, who were all Jewish but of Portuguese descent, these are the people that he learned the trade winds from. That's conventional history. You can dig that up in any, in any historiography. So what, what's, the, what's the deal with the codfish, bacalao? Mm -hmm. So the Portuguese, bacalao is a Portuguese word. Bacalao in Portuguese means a friendly fish. So they were coming here for uh, some say a thousand years, at least 500 years before Columbus came here. He learned of the trade winds that will take take the, the navigators to the to this continent to the west that he presented to be the Orient. He knew it wasn't the Orient. Right. So so this thing happened. Now according to according to conventional history, he also chose for himself a wife from the island of Madeira. Her name was Felipa Moniz Perestella. Conventional history tells you yes, he married a young Madeiran Portuguese by the name of Felipa Moniz Perestrello. Now, conventional history tells us that she was a Jew who gleefully converted to Catholicism, <laughs> which really never happened. No. The Jews <laughs> the of Spain die. <laughs> yeah, the Jews of Spain and Portugal were not were not those who would choose to will right. convert. You had to force them into conversion, which happened. So his wife, according to conventional history, was a wonderful Catholic who was converted from being a Jewist. Absolutely incorrect. She was forcibly converted or forced to take on a Jewish identity, right. uh, a Christian identity. So he takes his wife from Madeira. By the way, the word, the name Perestrello is actually Perez. Mm, okay. All right, Pere, Perez. And so he takes his, this is what, but conventional history gives us this idea that he was a good Roman Catholic boy, comes from Genoa, goes to Madeira to learn about the trade winds, marries a, f a ex, a former Jew. No, she was a practicing mm -hmm. Jew, and so was he, based on his actual name, which he signed off on in, in Genoa, so, the cathedral. So some of our listeners might not understand the significance of the last name, right? Mm -hmm. When when. The Jews were forced to convert. There were a list of last names they assigned them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's kind of easy to track back who was a Jew and who wasn't on the basis Fernandes. of the last name. Many of the Jews of Spain and Portugal took the name Fernandes because of Ferdinand and Isabella, stating that they've aligned themselves with right. the king of Spain, yeah. the, the Catholic crown. And so they would take on the name Fernandes or Fernandez. So here, here's, here's an interesting point for you. So my... Um, third-generation Madeiran. Mm -hmm. uh, Three-quarters of my, my lineage, my, 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 my ancestors, came from Madeira. And they had all of the classic Madeira names. Uh, uh, Fernandes was one of them. Uh, De Souza, uh, De Castro, Franco, mm -hmm. all Madeira names. So that's my connection there. But you have a connection yeah, as well because of yeah. Cuba. So he goes to Cuba. And this is the first island that he named. Right. He named it Cuba. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing fact that, and this is what I picked up from the documentary, it's an amazing fact that around Cuba are a set of islands. Mm -hmm. And these set of little islands, they bear the same names of the tongues around Cuba mm -hmm. in, in Portugal. The same names. So if you go to Cuba, Portugal, I did this on Google Maps. I spent about an hour this week saying, yeah, there it is. <laughs> and so there's about four or five tongues around Cuba, Portugal, that these islands around Cuba are named after. And they, they were named by Columbus. So you have the evidence, just mm -hmm. the, I mean, yep. reality, yep. that Columbus was who we say that he was. He was Salvador Fernandes Zaco, a Portuguese Jew uh, who left for, for the new world on Tisha B'Av. And, and, and so the idea is that the Portuguese crown devised a plan to deceive the king and queen of, of Spain, Spain. for the nun Isabella. 
and that there were three courtiers in the court of Ferdinand and Isabella, and these were two, three very powerful and influential Jewish courtiers. And it, it's these three courtiers that influenced or persuaded Isabella and Ferdinand that they needed to trust this, this, uh, this venture, that they would, they would, they would, they would uh, benefit with the riches of the Orient if they were to allow this, this navigator, <laughs> this young navigator, uh, to, to, to go to, if they would finance him mm -hmm. with ships and with everything he needed to do this. So these three courtiers, I have their names here, uh, Abraham Senor, Louis de Santa, Santangel, and Isaac uh, Abra, Abrabanel. Let me see, let me get that right. Abrabanel, mm -hmm. Abrabanel, which is a very common Jewish yep. Sephardic name. So these three courtiers, Abraham Senor, Louis de Santangel, and Isaac Abrabanel, these are the three courtiers who persuaded Is Isabella and Ferdinand to go along with this mission to sail to the west to get to the east. On Tisha B'Av, they sailed, and on these three ships, which are the... La Nina, La Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Were mostly converted Jews. Yep. Uh, the, yeah. the conventional history says yes, they were, but they were gleeful Catholics. They were <laughs> they were wonderful Catholics who had repented of their <laughs> their, their Judaization <laughs> and they had become. But most of them were conversos, what right. we call Maranos, and they came to the Western world. He made four trips. On his fourth trip, they arrested him because they suspected him of Judaizing, mm -hmm. and they they also suspected him of being a spy, a Portuguese spy, which they will correct. Mm -hmm. You know, most people don't understand if, if it were just that they would take you and kill you, you know, really just convert or die, it would have been one thing. But it wasn't that. It was no, horrible no. torture. Well, they wanted, so here's how the, the, the Inquisition functioned. You had two places in the Western Hemisphere where the auto de fe's mm -hmm. were carried out. Auto de fe, it means an act of faith, but the auto de fe's were, were trials. Right. And that's Lima, Peru, and Mexico City. Lima, Peru, by far the worst. Uh, Mexico City was pretty bad too. This is where they would bring suspected uh, Moranos, mm -hmm. Jews who were reverting to their ancestral faith, and they will try them. And part of the, pro well, a lot of the process was getting out of them who their leaders were, family members, mm -hmm. uh, parents and uncles and cousins, everyone that's involved. And in many cases, entire communities were brought to trial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did that happen? How did the Western Hemisphere become inundated with conversos or what we call Moranos, crypto Jews? How did that happen? Because of Columbus's journeys, and the, the preponderance of ships that came from yeah. Portugal, mostly Portugal, uh, following Columbus's journeys, they brought thousands yeah, of crypto Jews with them. And in fact, a certain crypto Jew by the name of Luis de Caballal, I think that's how you say it in Spanish, mm -hmm. Luis de Caballal, he settled from what is today Texas all the way to California. He was given a grant. He was Luis de Caballal, Luis de Caballal, was a conquistador, but he was actually a converted Jew. He brought over a hundred families initially. The fifth trip, Columbus's, not his trip, but the fifth trip after Columbus, Luis de Caballal brought over, he started the process of bringing over a hundred families who settled from Texas all the way to California. Today, there are still crypto Jewish communities in, in Mexico City. Uh, in New Mexico. New Mexico. New Mexico. Yeah. Arizona. Uh, California. Albuquerque, by the way, Albuquerque is a Jewish name. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a Portuguese Jewish name, Albuquerque. So this, this incredible thing happened. So in a very short space of time, following this, these, these journeys of Columbus and others, you had the Spanish Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition, that brought thousands of people to trial in Mexico City and Peru. They racked children, mm -hmm. put them on the rack. They, they tortured children to get out of them information on their parents and grandparents. They brought entire communities to trial. Luis de Caballal was killed in a battle with, with Native Americans. His son, Luis Caballal Jr., 
was racked and burned to the stake in Mexico City for being uh, a, a Judaizer. Uh, every Tisha B'Av in synagogues around the world, a poem is read, written by Luis Caballal Jr. The night before he was burned to the stake, he wrote, he wrote a poem. And this is the poem that's read in synagogues everywhere. So this is a real part of history, and Columbus is connected to it. The truth is, Columbus's mission was twofold. And this is going to be reflected if you look at the, the documentary. And this is what I've been saying for decades. Columbus's purpose was twofold. One, to distract and to deter the Spanish crown. Two, to provide safe havens for crypto Jews so they can revert, right. which began to happen in the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, Hesefi, Punamboco, Bahia, many parts of Brazil, and even in the Caribbean, uh, uh, Curaçao, Aruba, Barbados, Tobago, many of those islands, Jewish communities began to revert. Uh, Suriname, French Suriname, uh, Guyana, in these places, in the 1600s, 1700s, we began to see Jewish communities cropping up everywhere. That was the ministry of Christopher Columbus. This is what he did, and others after him. Now, that lasted to, to, that lasted to the early 1800s, and then the, those, those communities began, began to dissolve, and actually many of the American Jews and Canadian Jews actually comes from that movement. Mm -hmm. So you go to, you go to Jamaica, Today, you still have Jamaican Jews. They're Sephardic descent. Uh, they are a part of that movement that came from what we're talking about, from, that, from, from Columbus and his actual ministry. In Curaçao, you have the same phenomenon, where you have Jewish communities that goes back to that period. Why do they still exist? Because, because Jamaica, Curaçao, and Aruba rejected and refused the Catholic crown, the Spanish crown, completely. And so they were, they were allowed to continue to exist. So, so the effect that Columbus had was actually providing safe havens for Jews. I'm going to say this. Many Jews today who are free practicing Jews, they owe their existence to Columbus. That's a part of history that you'll have to dig deep in to really understand. And in, in, in years to come, decades and so on, it's going to become more revealed that this is actual, actually the case. One of the things you will see if you look at that documentary is that his two sons, Columbus's two sons, at his dying bed, pleaded with him to tell them the secrets that he kept to himself. Apparently, Columbus was known for harboring incredible secrets that he would not divulge, and he never did. He never did tell them what the secrets that he held on to were. Now, in his writings, and he wrote prolifically, I mean, his journals are extensive. In his writings, it is revealed. Throughout his writings, and, and, and just about every other page, you would find cryptic notations, like up on the corner of his, his, his writing and so on. And those cryptic notations are cryptic Jewish uh, Hebrew symbols, symbolism that's used in the Kabbalah and so on. They're all over his writings. Uh, there are people today that are still working to decipher his writings today. He wrote in Portuguese, but there are all these cryptic Hebrew symbols all over. And the, the, cryptic, sim the, the cryptic symbols, they all seem to point to, to the New Jerusalem and the restoration of Israel. Those seem to be the two reoccurring themes that those cryptic notations are all about that Israel will be restored, looking for the lost tribes of Israel, the restoration of Zion, throughout his writings. This was his passion. This was what consumed him. Again, you go to India, and in certain parts of India, I can't remember exactly where in India, and they have annals of his writings stored away in India. Scholars and researchers and historians, they go there to peer over his writings because there's a mystery and the mystery is very simple. He was a Sephardic Jew, the, the, the son of a Jewist, who was, you know, she, she, she had a relationship with a royal, a royal uh, prince who was probably Jewish himself and had this son who was given the privilege uh, to become a spy on behalf of Portugal 
and someone who will provide safe haven for Jews because the expulsion edict, for, folks, <laughs> uh, is exactly when he sailed yep. on Tisha B'Av. So you have it. Columbus was actually a spy, but he was Jewish. Uh, now, how is this connected? The question, how does this associate with the kingdom of God? Well, it's obvious. He was, he, was in, he was consumed with the idea of the restoration of Israel. He knew that the restoration of Israel would signify the ge'ulah, the redemption. And you know what? His movement was instrumental in that process. Because when Spain expelled their Jews, expelled their Jews from, from Spain, many of them ended up in Turkey, Turkey. Egypt, mm -hmm. North, North Africa. Africa, but then ultimately they ended up in the land of Israel. Right. So you had that movement from Spain that went eastward and ended up becoming the early Zionist movement. But then Columbus's efforts to harbor Jews in the West, to provide safe haven for conversos in the West, became the movement that ultimately brought the Zionist movement from the Western Hemisphere. Because again, I think... I think this is something that's, that's worth researching. I've done the research. I think it's hard to say just what percentage, but a large percentage of the Jewish people that's been in the Americas from the early centuries of, of the colonization of America, I'm talking the 1500s, 1600s, the majority of them came as a result of Columbus's efforts to provide these safe havens. I am convinced of it. So, around the beginning of the 1900s, uh, into where we are today, we, we, we began to see Jews from South America, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, certain parts of the Caribbean, even in this country, making Aliyah. They are no doubt descendants of the people that Columbus and his efforts, and people after Columbus even, uh, those are descendants of the people that they brought over to revert and to be the people that they were created to be the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, i tell you a little, a, little, a little side note. The governor of Puerto Rico in the year 1645-ish complained to the king of Spain in saying this, the majority of immigrants that are coming in are actually Portuguese Moranos. He complained about them, that they were coming up from Brazil and the Caribbean pretending to be Spaniards, pretending to be Catholics, but they were actually Portuguese and they were, they were crypto-Jews. He complained, nothing could have been done. Now, this was happening throughout the Americas. So this incredible movement that's hidden, was hidden, hidden then, but the history is now coming out. This movement is instrumental, was instrumental, in what, what is now the restoration of Israel. And the Bible, the prophets, all point to this incredible reality that, that at a certain point, God will begin the process of the restoration of Israel. Uh, uh, Jeremiah said it. He who scattered Israel would gather Israel, bring them back. And so the, the, the reality of the restoration of Israel is replete throughout the prophets. In fact, we teach this in our institute the, the, the most consistent theme throughout the prophets is the restoration of Israel. Mm -hmm. When Peter was baptized with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, he preached about the restoration of Israel. And so the, the idea of the restoration of Israel is not new, it's ancient. Well, Columbus was instrumental. He was God's vessel in beginning that process on a much larger scale. I think in the age to come, Christopher Columbus, in fact, Salvador Fernandez Zarco will be recognized as a, a pivotal individual, a very important individual in the restoration process. I am convinced of it. And I think he knew it. I think he knew it. I cannot read Portuguese, even though I'm of Portuguese descent. I can't read Portuguese. But there are Portuguese historians that are peering through his, his journals now, and they're amazed at what they're seeing. His passion for Zion, his passion for the restoration, his passion for God, the God of the Bible, it's all over his writings. Columbus, even though he gets a really bad rap, was a righteous man. Mm -hmm. 
but albeit he was very cryptic about who he was and what he was, he was doing. A spy. You his own be sons, right? His own <laughs> sons, and this is conventional history you now. His own sons at his dying bed said, "Please tell us what you've been hiding from us. Please give us the secrets that you're going, that that you that you're keeping with you. Let them go." And he wouldn't. And that's because he was on a mission. And I believe, as nuts as this sounds, he was a, he was on a mission from God. Mm -hmm. I don't want to invoke the yeah, blues brothers. You kind of sounded like the blues here, brothers. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. <laughs> We're on a mission from it's God. A, it's cliche, but I want, to, I want to present that again in, in a stronger form. Columbus was God's vessel. Right. Yep. Like, like many of the other men of renown that were used by God, Columbus was used by God. Yep. Uh, so the restoration process is what Columbus has really succeeded in. He is, he is a part of that process. Again, the Bible is replete. All of the prophets spoke prolifically about the restoration of Israel. And Columbus is not alone. There are many other so-called conquistadors. Louis de Caballal, he provided safe haven for 100 families. Within 20 years after Columbus died, he provided this. Uh, so, folks, this is about the restoration of Israel. Columbus, this, the history of Columbus that's now being revealed is fascinating. He was Jewish, crypto Jew, a crypto Jew. He was a spy uh, working against Spain and Portu uh, Portu Spain on behalf of the Portuguese. The Portuguese won that little contest again. But the restoration of Israel is what this is really all about. So how does that pertain to the kingdom of God? That, you know, we are we Christians. We we fail too often to see the connection between the restoration of Israel and the establishment of the kingdom of God. The prophets are all consistent mm -hmm. in this fact. When God begins the process of the restoration of Israel, at that time or shortly thereafter, he will judge the nations. Shortly thereafter, he will establish the great king, the kingdom of God in the earth, and Zion will be glorified. These are all themes that we see in the Bible, that we teach in our institute. Right. The judgment of the nations is, is almost synonymous with the restoration of Israel. The judgment of the nations is synonymous with the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. The establishment of the kingdom of heaven. So Columbus was instrumental in that sense. And I think he, again, I have to say it again, I think he knew the significance of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. I think he knew it. Uh, so, uh, now, the, the theme of the restoration of Israel and, and Tisha B'Av, there's so much there to dig into, so much there to unpack, which we don't have the time for. I always, when I think of the restoration of Israel, how it relates to me as a Christian, and all of what we talked about, I always think of Psalm 126. In Psalm 126, let me read, let me read it, Jim. Sure. Psalm 126 is such a, such a meaningful psalm to me and should be to any believer in Messiah Jesus as it relates to the topic we're focusing now, focusing on now, the, the restoration of Israel. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them, meaning Israel. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. So this, this, these three verses in, in the Psalms are so relevant to who we are as believers, how we should relate to the ultimate restoration of Israel. When Zion is restored, we should be rejoicing over this, over the fact that God has done great things for them. And he has done great things for us in that he is al he's allowed us to be a part of this process. Again, Columbus was instrumental in this process. That's a different take on history, but I think it's more accurate than the, the fallacy of him being an Italian who never spoke Italian or wrote in Italian, uh, no, hen no heritage at all in Italy, but a Portuguese navigator, a Jew, who was so important in the restoration of Israel. 
Do you think the docu that you mentioned uh, is Christopher Columbus, who we think he is? Do you think you could pull that up on YouTube or, you know, some, anyone can you get know, it? Prime I, Prime TV or absolutely. You just get on there and you and you word Google, search it, right? Yeah, you yeah. Google uh, is Columb is Christopher Columbus, who we think he is. It'd probably come up just with that title. It, it'll yeah. pop right up. It's 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 a, it's about 10, 10, 10 or twelve years old. Uh, I, you know, I, I knew about it. I, I only saw it for the first time uh, a week or two ago because I wanted to research on this subject subject again. Right, right. Because this is a question that always comes up, right? Right. So I said, wow. Oh, for sure, because what you're, what you're saying is right. s somewhat contrary to what we were all taught as children. Uncontroversial. It's, right. I mean, <laughs> right. There, are, there are Italians today that will hate me. Yep. Uh, put a hit on me. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, the reality is, uh, yes, this, this documentary provides so much information. Again, Cuba, uh, that I never knew about those islands being named after towns around Cuba and Portugal, but they're there. Mm -hmm. I, I searched it myself. It's, it's all verifiable. So this, this is new history. So nothing from the Neapolitan coast of Italy. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if he was Italian, That's right, he'd yeah. be singing Torna Suriento. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, he probably sang songs in Ladino, which is right. the, ancient, the right. ancient Hebrew language of the Sephardic Jews. So uh, the question, I don't, I don't even know if we did it justice. In, I, in, think so. yeah, it, I think so. Yeah, I think so. At There's least so prompted a, a lot of interest in it. Yeah, so sure. much, it's like... I, I, I have a, I have a tank of water and a funnel about with a, with a, with a nose about that big to, to I, I just yep. I can share so much on this. It's just it's such a fascinating subject and it's relevant to me as well. Um, it's relevant to every believer in Messiah Jesus actually, because this does concern the ultimate the ultimate kingdom of God in the earth. So, so yeah, love 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 the subject. Can talk about yeah. it. It's a good question. Yeah. Yes, very good question. That's our program. Uh, if, if these questions that we're answering raise other questions in your thinking, surely they do. You are invited to please share your questions with us. And you can do so by emailing us at voice at buildupzion.org. That's voice at buildupzion.org. We're hosting a meeting with Jeremy Gimpel on August 7th. That's Tisha B'Av on the Hebrew calendar. So it's kind of unique that he would be coming specifically on Tisha B'Av. And so you're welcome to come join us if you're in the Central Florida area. The meeting will be at Fellowship Church at 7.30 p.m. on, again, August 7th. And until next week, Shalom! Shalom.